party. They, they're going to nominate. This is a lecture for my uh, first hour class on um, February 8th. Even though they're going to fail as a uh, political party, their ideas lived on. And uh, almost everything, you know, we listed the other day, we listed the other day all the things that the populace stood for, and almost everything that we talked about uh, is a fact of life today in 21st century American culture. Uh, you know, every time you vote, that's populism at work. The ballots you mark, the candidates that you're for, that's populism. Every time you spend a dollar, uh, that's populism at work. So populism, the populists have gone away, but their party uh, has, has not gone away. And, and, and we've talked about William Allen White. What's the matter with Kansas? We did that. Yes. Okay. And I told you what, I just want to make sure I've got everything down for the test. So I told you what he said in that editorial, right? Okay. So as you point out though, the uh, populist, they were a great <coughs> challenge. Uh, we haven't talked about the Omaha platform, have we? We have? Yeah. Oh, good. Good. The Omaha platform. Um, Harrison and Cleveland. Okay. So, um, okay. Hmm. Okay. Well, good. Uh, so the populists were strong enough then. We're, we're, then we're in the election of 1892. The populists were strong enough in 1892 to nominate a presidential candidate. And I gave you the name of their presidential candidate, right? General James B. Weaver. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm covering all the bases. Like I say, I do this five times a day and all five classes are in slightly different places. And so my memory isn't good enough to keep up with that. Uh, and so the populist nominate, you know, the populists are this liberal party and their support in the country was growing. And um, the Democrats and Republicans in 1892, they are dedicated to one thing. And that's we've got to stop the populists. And so they nominated, the Democrats and the Republicans nominated two of the most conservative candidates in the history of American politics. This is the Republican, Benjamin Harrison. Uh, and he, without a doubt, was the uh, most conservative president we've ever had. Uh, if you like conservative presidents, you would have loved this guy. He stood for absolutely no change. And if you don't have this down, get it down. The Republicans, you know, so what do the Republicans stand for in 1892? And you may already have this down, but the Republicans, uh, you know, they, you know, there, there's a thing called stand patism. Okay. Stand patism. In other words, keep things the same. The Republicans said the country's doing fine. We're recovering from the civil war. The dollar is strong. We need to keep the gold standard. We need to keep high tariffs. We need to keep foreign goods out of America. President Biden talked about that last night, by the way. That's one of the points he made. Uh, you know, so that he, he said very, he said, buy America in his state of the union message. We need to. And so that's what Harrison and the Republicans are saying. We, you know, keep these foreign goods out, uh, keep a high tariff uh, and, you know, buy American. The more you American goods you buy, the stronger and richer the country becomes. The stronger and richer the country becomes, it's better off for all of you. So said the Republicans. Well, the Democrats nominated uh, Grover Cleveland. We've talked about him before. Uh, you might recall, and I think we probably did this yesterday, but you might recall in 1884, uh, the uh, scandalous election of 1884, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Uh, he was elected. Grover Cleveland was elected president in 1884. Uh, there hadn't been a Democrat in the White House since 1861. Uh, so he was the first Democrat elected in 28 years. Uh, and he ran again for re-election in 1888. Uh, but the American people, after four years of Grover Cleveland, had had enough of him. And in 1888, they elected a Republican named Benjamin Harrison. Okay. Uh, a Republican named Benjamin Harrison. And of course, Harrison won. We probably did this yesterday. Harrison won in the electoral vote, uh, but Cleveland won the popular vote. And here we have another scandalous election. Cleveland actually got the most votes, but it's possible to get the most votes and not become president. What you're aiming to win is the electoral college. If you don't think that's true, uh, ask Al Gore. In 2000, Al Gore had 
500,000 more votes, a half a million more votes than George Bush. George Bush became president because he won the Electoral College. If you don't think that's true, ask Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton had um, 2 million more votes than Donald Trump had in uh, uh, 2016, but Donald Trump won the Electoral College and he became president of the United States. Joe Biden had 3 million more popular votes than Donald Trump in 2020, and he won the Electoral College, so there was no question about that election, even though some of Trump's supporters say the election was stolen. It was not. But anyway, that's another topic for another day. But just like the, some of the hardcore Trump supporters in 2020, uh, the Democrats, because Cleveland had won the most votes, you, know, you can't get this through the American people's head. We're a republic. If we were a democracy, if we were a democracy, Hillary Clinton would have been would have been president of the United States. We're not. We're a republic, and and a group of people from all fifty states, five hundred and thirty eight of them, call the electoral college. They choose the president. We choose the electors, but they choose the president. Okay, so uh, the popular vote, well doesn't really count when it comes to electing the president. That's not quite true, but it's pretty close. Anyway, Cleveland and the Democrats in 1888 said, we were robbed, you stole the election from us, but we're gonna come back in 1892, and this time we are going to win, and there's going to be no doubt about it. And so in 1892, uh, get this down, if you don't have it down, in 1892, the, the Democrats nominated Cleveland again. And in eight to get this down in 18, if you don't have it down, did we, did we do this yesterday? Yes. Okay. We touched up on it. Huh? We touched up on okay. it. Okay. Well, I'm touching on it again. Anyway, in 1892, Grover Cleveland was elected. So uh, get this down. Uh, Grover Cleveland became, Grover Cleveland became the first president to serve literally two uh, separate two separate terms, uh, two non-consecutive terms. And here's what I mean by that. Grover Cleveland was elected in 1884. He was sworn in in 1885, and he served until 1889. And then he was defeated. Uh, but four years later, in 1892, he comes back, and he wins in 1892. And uh, he uh, will serve until uh, 1897. Okay, 1897. So uh, there's a gap in his administration. He wasn't president and then reelected. He was president. He was defeated. <laughs> and then uh, he was elected again. So he's the only president so far to serve non-consecutive terms. Now, Donald Trump <coughs> was defeated in 2020 by Joe Biden. And this is a very similar situation. And the Trump supporters still to this day, some of them, not all. But some of them say, well, the election was stolen. And we're going to be back, they say, in 2024. In 2020, they said, we're going to be back in 2024, and we're going to renominate Donald Trump, and this time he's going to win. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen. I don't like it, but I think that's exactly what's going to happen. I think the Republicans, right now Donald Trump is leading all the Republicans uh, so far for the Republican nomination for president in 2024. I think he's going to get it, and I think he's going to win. I don't, he won't win with my vote, uh, and, I'm, and I'm a Republican. He won't win with my vote, but, I, but regardless of how I vote, I think Donald Trump is going to win. I think Joe Biden is a pretty weak candidate, uh, pretty weak candidate. And I voted for him, but I think he's a pretty weak candidate going into 2024. So I think, and so if that happens, uh, then uh, Donald Trump will become only the second president to, um, to, um, serve non-consecutive terms. And of course, if that happens, if that happens, when it does happen, of course, all these talking heads on television will be going back to the election of 1884 and the election of 1888 and the election of 1892, trying to explain to the American people what happened and how will that affect the American people when they start talking about all those elections in the 19th century. It'll go zip right over their heads because they don't know they don't know the history. They don't know the history of this country. Uh, well, I'll get this down. Uh, so you have three candidates. You've got uh, Harrison. He's the incumbent. He's running for re-election. You've got Grover Cleveland. He's the challenger. Uh, and Grover Cleveland won. Uh, and then you've got a populist named uh, James B. Weaver. And get this down. James B. Weaver did pretty good. 
there were 12 million votes cast and he won a million of them. That's pretty good. The populace, the pop, for a third party, the pop, they didn't come close to winning, but for a third party, the populace did pretty good. He ca actually carried four Western states. Uh, there were three states that elected populist governors. There were five populist U.S. senators who were elected to the Senate. And there were 10 populists who were elected to the House of Representatives. My point is the populists didn't even come close to winning, but they did about as well as any third party usually does. In fact, they did better than any third party in United States history. But here's the point. Get this down. Even though the populists had lost, even though the populists had lost, they got the attention of the establishment. They challenged the establishment. The establishment defeated them. But the establishment, when this election's over, they kind of had this attitude. We dodged a bullet. We have to make some reforms. We have to make some sort of reform or we're going to have a full-fledged revolution on our hands in this country. And so Grover Cleveland became president. You know, things looked bright and happy. He was sworn in in March of 1893. By the way, by his second term, actually in his first term, Cleveland got married. You remember he was a bachelor. He never had married. And he married this woman. He was 50 and she was 22. She was considered the, the most beautiful woman in America, Frances Folsom. You know, today they have, I guess they have cover girls on magazines. Well, in the 1890s, they didn't call them cover girls. They called them Gibson girls after this photographer that took their pictures. And the most beautiful women in America were considered to be these Gibson girls. Well, there's one. And Grover Cleveland, this 50-year-old bachelor, big fat bachelor, uh, he wins her and, and gets married. People have said, well, you know, how why in the world is this young, good-looking, maybe the most beautiful woman in America? Why in the world she marry this fat uh, but well, he's president. So there's an old saying, power is the greatest aphrodisiac. That may be true. You know, Some people marry for wealth. Some people marry, marry for position and power. I don't know if she did. She might have been madly in love with him. I don't know. There's, there's the happy couple. <clears throat> there's the White House wedding. The American people like nothing better than a White House wedding. And so there's a sketch of Grover Cleveland being married, and they have several children. The first child they had was this little girl right here, little Ruth Cleveland, uh, and she became, you know, the country's just so happy. Their old bachelor president finally got married, and then to make things even better, oh well, my God, he has a little baby girl. She's rather cute, and so the whole country fell in love with little Ruth Cleveland. As I often tell students, Never underestimate the ability of an American businessman to make a buck because this little girl, there were pictures of her everywhere. The whole country was talking about little baby Ruth Cleveland. That's what they called her. And an American candy maker came up with that every time. And then, by the way, that's still on the, I can't eat candy anymore. That's still on the shelf. Isn't it? They still mm -hmm. Yeah, well, next time you buy a baby Ruth, I want you to think of good old Grover, good old Grover Keith Cleveland. That was not, just for the record, you know, this is really the most unimportant thing I'll probably talk about. It was not named after Babe Ruth, the baseball player. That's just, you know, somebody, somebody made that story up and it stuck. It was made after little baby Ruth, little baby Ruth Cleveland. But anyway, uh, Cleveland had more important things to deal with than that. Get this down. Uh, he'd been president for about six months. You know, everything looks good. He'd been president for about six months and a panic struck. And what was a panic? What was a panic? The change of currency? No, no. Uh, remember talking about the panic of 73? A panic is a depression. Get that down. That's what they used to call depressions. Today we call them depressions. When banks collapse, when businesses go, when thousands of people are unemployed, that's a depression. Well, in those days they called it a panic. So a panic hit. It was called it was the panic of 1893. Get this down. It's one of the worst. It's not the worst depressions, but it's one of the, one of the worst depressions. The panic of 93. You know, we have all sorts of panics up until the Great Depression. We haven't had the Great Depression will soon be about 100 years ago. How many depressions have we had since the Great Depression? Four. Four. That's an educated get. None. Zero. Because, because Franklin Roosevelt, a great progressive, 
took a lot of the old populist ideas, as you're going to see, and during, he had a program. Have you heard of the New Deal? You ever heard of that? Roosevelt becomes president. It's the worst depression in history. Half the country is literally starving. And Roosevelt takes a group of the old populist ideas that we've talked about. You know, look, the populists are done in 1892. After 1892, when they lose this press, they break up as a party. But in 1930, 40 years after the populist party uh, ceased to exist, Franklin Roosevelt's going to take their ideas and he's going to put them in a program called the New Deal. Uh, to combat the Great Depression, uh, and that's where Social Security and the minimum wage and the eight-hour day, workman's comp, unemployment benefits if you lose your job, all these things that we have today that would help us if there was another depression, that's where it came from. All those things that the populists talked about and never got passed into the law, Franklin Roosevelt did in the 1930s in a program called the New Deal. And by the way, the New Deal didn't end the depression, but it helped the suffering masses during the Great Depression. People who were starving got fed. Uh, jobs were created by the government. Uh, you go down to build your homecoming floats down there, in that National Guard Armory, that was built by a, a New Deal program called the WPA. Uh, the government hired men in the 30s to build that. That was the difference between families eating, having a roof over their head, something to wear, building that National Guard Armory. Every time you go in the Ufala Post Office, look at it. There's a white marble block on the front of it. It has WPA, 1940. The Ufala Post Office was part of this program started by the New Deal to give people employment. Okay, They built public buildings. So, you ever play a football game at Holdenville, that rock stadium? The Jinx football stadium was built in the 1930s. WPA, you ever build, you ever uh, play a, any kind of sports over at, um, oh, what the, I, I'm losing my, well, anyway, I can't even remember towns anymore. Mm, well, Anyway, that's you about it. Huh? You go. No, well, has Hugo got one of those big rock stadiums? Yeah. Anytime you see a rock stadium, I'm thinking one right here. Stadium. No, this town right here on I-4. Huh? What'd you say? Pra um, not Prague. <coughs> no, I'm talking about on Interstate 40, uh, going toward Oklahoma City. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okima, you're exactly right. That's what I'm trying to think of. You ever play a football game or sports over there? They've got a huge stadium. It's a big rock stadium. Half of it's football field and half of it's baseball field. You'll rarely see that, a baseball field. and a, It's just like if we attach a baseball field to the end of this view, you don't see that. But that was built by the WPA during the Great Depression. And you know what that was stadium in Okima was used for during World War II? It was a prison camp for German POWs. Prison camp, yeah, right there in Okima, Oklahoma. They shipped them over here from North Africa. After they got defeated and shot up by the American and the British Army, they put them on boats and shipped them here to Oklahoma. The Okima football stadium was a prison camp during World War II. <coughs> but it was built by the WPA during the Great Depression. Well, anyway, anyway, fact is, is that this depression hit, get this down and a uh, thousand, get this down, Thousands of people were unemployed for years. Banks and businesses went collapsed. They went out of business. People lost every nickel they had. And was there any government help for these people? No. No, why not? Because this is the age of what? What's the prevailing social philosophy? Why, why doesn't the government help people in the 1890s? What was the attitude of the government toward unemployed people and poor people and hungry people and homeless people? This is the age of rugged individualism. <coughs> this is the age of rugged individualism. You're on your own. If you're hungry, if you're homeless, it's your fault. That was the government attitude. And of course, desperate people, get this down, desperate workers, unemployed workers began 
to form large armies, get this down, and march on their state capitals. And even some of them went to Washington, D.C., in front of the U.S. Capitol, demanding, trying to put pressure on the government to help them. And one of the most famous armies of unemployed, get this down, armies of unemployed were led by this man, write him down, Jacob Coxey. <coughs> Jacob Coxey, he led an army of about 600 unemployed workers, people that had no jobs and there was nobody to help them, he's going to lead them all the way to Washington, D.C., demanding that the government help them, demanding that the government help them. He wasn't poor and hungry and homeless. He was a middle-class businessman. He probably had about $250,000 in the bank. In those days, that would have, or in today's money, that would have been several million dollars. But he had great sympathy for the poor. And he also got this down, Jacob Coxey. And by the way, this army that he leads, this army of unemployed workers, it's known as Coxey's Army. Coxey's Army, that's what the press called it. And they're going to leave from Ohio and go to all the way, march all the way to Washington, D.C. And... Uh, he had a plan to end the depression. You know, he wants to lead this army of unemployed workers to Washington, D.C. to emphasize the fact that times are hard. Get this down. Times are hard. And now the government has to help people. But he also said, we've got a plan to end the depression. And here was his plan. Get this down. He said, government, this is what Coxie stood for. He said, government should print up millions of dollars in paper money. Write that down, paper money. Would that paper money be worth much? No, it wouldn't be worth much. What was it? What was American money at the time? Gold. So this paper money would not be worth much of anything. However, it would be money. Maybe you could buy a loaf of bread with some of it. And he said the government should print up millions of dollars and then... <coughs> put the unemployed, put the unemployed to work building roads. He said, you know, we don't even, and we didn't. He said, we don't have a national highway system. Take print up money. It won't be worth much. But take all of these unemployed people and put them to work building roads and pay them each a dollar and 50 cents a day. At least they and their families can eat. He said, that's my plan. Uh, and so his army, and on Easter Sunday morning, he and his new wife, they just had a little baby. I mean, my God. They didn't have, they had a new baby and a uh, little boy. And he and his wife got in a buggy with these 600 unemployed men, mainly, and started marching, walking to Washington, D.C. By the way, that little baby's name was. Can you read that? Can you read that? Richard Wiggle Tender, Salt Lake's public, private. This note is a legal tender for all debts public, and that means with this you can pay debts. You can buy things. That's that's written on there by the United States government. That's why that piece of paper is worth something. If I went over and bought gas today and said, well, Went in to pay for it and said, here's some great notes about Coxie's army and the, and the Depression of 1893. How many, they would say, uh, get secured. This is legal tender. Because Coxie stood for printing paper money, he named that little baby boy of his legal tender Coxie. You know, I guess that kid got beat up all the time when he got into school. But legal, legal tender Coxie and his mother and father get in this buggy and they head off to Washington, D.C., and as they're heading toward Washington, D.C., the press is covering that. I mean, this is a big deal. This is like this Chinese balloon coming over the other day. It was in every newspaper in America. 
And then the government in Washington's nervous. They said, uh-oh, you know, and he's gaining a few supporters as he goes. The government in Washington says, this may be the revolution we've been fearing. The workers finally may rise up and attack the government. And so they had the police and they had the army ready when they get there. And what Coxie intended to do was pull his buggy up in front of the Capitol and go stand on the steps and just make a speech to his followers. <laughs> but, the, but the Washington, the Capitol Police, the Washington, D.C. police had been told, watch his every move. And if he breaks any law or statute, arrest him. And so there was a sidewalk leading up to the Capitol building where he was going to get on the steps and make this speech. Uh, and instead of walking on the sidewalk, he cut across the grass. He took a shortcut. There was a sign that said, keep off the grass. And as soon as he did this, after this journey all the way from Ohio to Washington, D.C., the police snatched him up and arrested him and put him in jail for 20 days. I think they fined him $50. And then they told all of his followers, unless you want to go to jail, go back to Ohio or wherever it is you're from. And that's what they did. And then, of course, after 20 days, they let him out of jail. And he went home, too. So this is another failure here. But the point is, get this down. The government, you know, Coxie, get this down. What's the point of Coxie's army? Coxie had gotten the attention of the government. The whole nation followed this army on its march to Washington, D.C. Uh, he got the attention of the government. Something has to change. Something has to change. Capitalism is working for only a few, and it has to be reformed. If not, there, the next time, uh, the revolution may succeed. Uh, so it sort of struck fear in the hearts of the policymakers in Washington, D.C. So things were not going very well in Cleveland's second administration. And to make matters worse, uh, Cleveland was uh, a cigar lover. He smoked cigars, and he was running his tongue over the roof of his mouth one night, and he felt a little rough patch up there in the roof of his mouth. And so he called in his doctor, <coughs> pardon me, and they examined him, and it was cancer. Uh, and they told him, there's only one thing we can do. We're going to have to, you know, you've got a bone at the roof of your mouth called a palate. And uh, if that wasn't there, I guess you could stick your tongue if it was long enough up and tickle the bottom half of your brain. That separates your brain from your mouth. And they said, we're going to have to cut the, split your palate in half and take out half of it. And then we're going to replace that with a new jaw and a new palate made out of rubber. Uh, and, but the big problem was, you know, when and how are we going to do it? Because, you know, Cleveland said this, we can't let this be known. We can't let it be known that I have cancer and I'm going to be going through this surgery because it might cause the economy to even get worse. You understand for all you future stockholders, any of you who have stocks, any of you have stocks, usually there's somebody that has stocks. For all you people that are going to play the stock market, you understand that all sorts of things can affect the stock market. Uh, a few years ago, there was a tsunami that hit the coast of Asia and killed 300,000 people who were out on the beach, I guess, in one afternoon. And, and that, the, because of that far away event that happened on the other side of the world, millions of dollars were lost in the stock market. On the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963, the stock market that day, November 22nd, 1963, lost more money uh, than it, it did in the Great Crash of 1929 that signaled the beginning of the Great Depression. So political assassinations, earthquakes, this earthquake that they just had in Syria where tens of thousands, I'm sure people who are in the stock market have lost some money. I don't know how much, but all sorts of things can affect the stock market. And Grover Cleveland knew that. And he said, you know what, if they find out I've got cancer, um, you know, the president, uh, they it may affect the stock market. And so it may affect the economy. So here's what they plan to do. <coughs> they said, we're going to put you on the presidential yacht. All presidents have a yacht out there in the Potomac River. I think they've got one now called the Sequoia and all sorts of presidents the last several years have used it. And um, we're going to put you on this yacht and um, we're going to go up to New York Harbor. We're going to tell the press that the president's going fishing. And while we've got you on that yacht up in New York Harbor uh, sailing around, uh, we're going to uh, cut your palate open, pull half of it out, and replace it with that rubber jaw and, and palate. <clears throat> so that's what they did. And they rubbed cocaine on the roof of his mouth.
to deaden it. And they did. They just went in and split that open, pulled it out, and put the new roof of his mouth and jawbone uh, in there. When they put, and then and then the president came out of the anesthetic. And when he did, he couldn't talk. Okay, the thing didn't fit, so they had to put him under again, knock it out again, reshape it, put it in. Uh, but for several months after that, Grover Cleveland he could talk, but he couldn't pronounce certain words. Uh, and you could tell that there was something wrong. Of course, there was no television. There was no radio. The, the telephone was just coming online in those days. Uh, and so the presidents in those days could get away with a lot more than they could get away with today. So eventually he recovered. I don't think he ever quite recovered so far as his speech was concerned. But he lives uh, well into the 20th century. Uh, and the American people didn't know anything about that until long after it was over. So I guess... The Cleveland administration dodged a bullet there. Well, by the election of 1896, get this, by the election of 1896 then, Grover Cleveland was the most hated man in America. He was blamed for starting the Depression. Presidents don't start depressions and presidents don't end depressions. That's a great American myth. But by 1896, he was the most hated man in America. He was blamed for starting the Depression. Get this down. His own party didn't want him. The Democrats said, we've got to get rid of this guy. Some Democrats are saying right now, if Joe Biden runs for re-election, he'll be 82 years old. He'll be too old. We'll lose the election. There's a move right now among some Democrats to replace Joe Biden in 2024. They say, we've got to get somebody younger who can win. Well, it wasn't an age issue with Cleveland, but the fact <laughs> is uh, he was blame for this depression. And they said, we've got to get rid of it. In this election, get this down, there are two major issues. You know, most elections come down to one or two main things. And so what are the two major issues in this campaign? What are the American people looking for a president to do? What? End the depression is one. And what's that's right. That's the main one. Get that down in the depression. And what's the, what's the, <clears throat> Other big issue in this campaign. It's the overriding issue of the Gilded Age. Any other th any other issues on the minds of the people in the Gilded Age you can think of? Biggest political issue of the Gilded Age. I told you about it the other day. The cash, all the money changes, never, not the money, there is a tax. Well, you're in the ballpark. What kind of money we'll have? Get this down. Will America have gold or what? Silver. Silver. Write that down. That's, that's the next big issue of this campaign. So the depression and the money issue. You're right. The depression or the money issue. Well, the populist, you know, now we're in 1896. The populist had lost in 1892. And so their party, got this down, disbanded. But the populists didn't go anywhere. The populists didn't go anywhere. They were still around. And their idea in 1896 was, look, we tried in 1892 and lost. We still have the same ideas. We just have to find a political party to join that will promote these ideas for us. If we can convince one of the major American political parties, and what, what, what are the major American political parties then and now? Democratic. Democrat and Republican. If we can, the populist, their ideas, if we can join one of those two parties, and we can convince one of those two parties to take our ideas and fight for them, even though the president won't be called a populist, in effect, we will have someone who believes in populist ideas in the White House. And so they joined one of the major two parties in 1896. Which party, Democrat or Republican, do you think was more sympathetic to the populist ideas? Which party did they join? Republican. Huh? Republican. No, what, what are, not Repu what are Repu Republicans? They're conservatives, and Republicans stand for what? No change. Yeah, and, and on the big issue of money, what do the Republicans stand for? Gold. 
gold. What are the, what do the populists stand for? Silver. Silver. So there's no way that the Republicans are going to let them in. So get this down. Uh, but you answered the question. Get this down. They joined the Democrat Party. In fact, some people say in 1896, they took the Democrat Party over. So in 1896, the Democrat Party is a fusion party. Okay, get that down. That means several groups have come together. Fusion. Several groups have come together to form one party. So in 1896, the Democrat Party is is a fusion party. Okay. And the Democrat Party, we're talking about the Democrats now, it's a divided party. There's a fight in the Democrat Party between the conservative Democrats. Who's the leader in the Democrats? Who's the leader of the conservative Democrats? How many Democrats in 1896 do you know? Oh, uh, Robert Cleveland. Who? Cleveland. Cleveland. Write that down. Cleveland. Cleveland. Very unpopular, but he's the leader of the conservative Democrats, and they stand for gold. You're right. Democrats don't want any, uh, the conservatives don't want anything to change. <clears throat> and then there are the populist Democrats that have just come into the party in 1896, the populist Democrats, and they are liberals. That year, the Democrats met to nominate their presidential candidate in Chicago. Get all this down. They met in Chicago, and it was a dogfight. <coughs> Liberal Democrats versus conservative Democrats. For a solid week, the Democrat Party fought. Liberals versus conservatives. The liberals, of course, are the silver Democrats. Silver versus gold. Back and forth it went. Fight. Debate. And finally, on the last night of the convention, get this man down, William Jennings Bryan. On the last night of the Democrats, and here they've been fighting and tearing each other up. And by the way, the Republicans are watching all this, and what do the Republicans think about this? about the Democrats fighting each other good for us. They're happy about it. This is very good for us. <coughs> but we'll get to the Republicans in a moment. But this man, William Jennings Bryan, and by the way, spell that correctly. Students, for some reason, they hear me saying, I'm not saying Bryant. It's Bryan. William Jennings Bryan. Here this fight had been going on all week. And William Jennings Bryan gets up to give the last speech of the debate. For a week, they've been fighting, tearing the party to pieces. And this guy gets up to give the last speech of the debate. He was young. And by the way, get used to this guy because he's going to be with us a long time. Three times the Democrats nominate him for president. Three times. He never wins. But he's a power in American politics from the night he makes this speech until the day he dies in 1926. So he's going to be around with us a long time, so just get used to him. But anyway, uh, get this down about Brian. He was a populist Democrat. Connor Harridge, come by the office real quick, please. Brian was a populist. Brian was a populist Democrat. So that means in this debate, he's arguing for what? Silver. Silver. Okay, he's arguing arguing for silver. So get this down. He's the leader of the populist Democrats. Cleveland is the leader of the gold bug Democrats. And Brian is going to close the debate with a speech. Get this down. Called, some historians call this the most famous speech since the Gettysburg Address. I don't think that's true, but he's going to get up and deliver a speech called the Cross of gold, one of the most famous speeches in American history. And when we come back tomorrow, uh, we'll talk about what he said in the cross of gold speech.